What is Vladimir Putin's greatest weapon? Tanks? Kalashnikovs? Nuclear weapons? None of the above. It's gas and energy resources. Gas, oil and coal are Russia's greatest export resource, which bankroll old Vladimir's dangerous and disruptive regime. And now here in the West, we are feeding the monster of his regime by buying billions of quids worth of Russian gas, oil and coal every year. In particular, countries like Germany, who under the impossibly overrated leadership of Angela Merkel, chose not to invest in nuclear power 10 years ago and are now dependent on Putin to keep the lights on in Berlin, Hamburg and Munich. It means Germany are unable to talk tough with Putin because Russia is now a decisive stakeholder in Germany's infrastructure. You can't bite the hand that feeds you. This is why the West turned a blind eye to Russia's disgraceful annexation of Crimea in 2014 and why it seems likely that Putin will invade Ukraine in the days to come. It's not helped, of course, by the disastrous U.S. President Joe Biden. This is a man whose botched departure from Afghanistan established the theme of Western weakness and surrender. Ukraine is an amazing country, the second largest by area in the whole of Europe. It's twice the size of Germany. And I've had the privilege of working there. A beautiful country with great people, a great history, and their overnight trains are an experience to behold with strangers sat together in carriages sharing food and more than a few glasses of vodka. Ukraine's only crime, it seems to me, is its commitment to democracy, a market economy and eventual membership of the Western Security Alliance, NATO. So have we got their back? No, quite the opposite. We are bending over backwards to accommodate Putin himself. The Germans, for example, have effectively signed off Nord Stream 2, an enormous gas pipeline which will cement Russia's dominance of the energy market across Europe. And it will give Putin the ability to unilaterally switch off power supplies to Ukraine whenever he fancies. Putin can literally pull the plug on one of our great Eastern European allies. How is that acceptable? Meanwhile, here in the UK, hardworking Brits are in the grip of a cost of living crisis caused by the extraordinarily damaging experiment of lockdowns. How so? What's the connection? Well, if you print money, keep interest rates artificially low and slow down supply chains, you create inflation. But the horrific cost of living crisis is being exacerbated by fuel prices, because even though we are standing on hundreds of years worth of potential energy, we import it from all around the world. With vast reserves of oil, coal and shale gas of our own, we buy it from somewhere else. It's like the Arabs buying sand or the Eskimos buying ice. As the brilliant Ross Clark points out in the Daily Mail newspaper, and here's an interesting article. 20 years ago, Britain was self-sufficient in oil. No longer. We produced 49 million tonnes of oil in 2020, but had to import 63.7 million tonnes, 8 billion of which came from, you guessed it, our pals in Russia. And Britain lies at the western end of a European gas grid, powered in large part by Russian gas pipes. If Russian gas were to be withheld from the east, our gas supply from Europe would swiftly end. So what about fracking? Shale gas is a far cleaner fuel than gas and coal, although perhaps not a long-term solution if we're going to get carbon down. But it is certainly a great sh short to medium-term option that has achieved energy independence for America and a fraction of the fuel costs for our pals on the other side of the pond. Fracking was even backed by former President Barack Obama, who recommended shale gas as a lower carbon bridge fuel. According to experts, we've got at least 50 years of the stuff beneath our feet. Frack, baby frack. It makes so much fracking sense. And what about coal? Well, we have drastically cut back coal production. Now, maybe that's great. You think we're saving the planet, except we're not. We just buy coal from somewhere else. In 2020, 45% of our coal was imported in spite of Britain 
sitting on several hundreds worth of reserves in terms of years. That's right, several hundred years. Once again, Russia was the single biggest source of our imports, shipping 1.62 million tons to us. Do you see the problem? The idiocy of our energy policy defies comprehension. So a lack of energy independence is fueling the cost of living crisis, leaving us exposed to international energy prices and adding to the corrosive problem of inflation. But a lack of energy independence, as we're seeing in the Ukraine, also has national security implications. Buying energy from international bad actors like Russia just fills their coffers and provides them with the resources with which to threaten the free world. So what about nuclear? Well done to the French for getting on board with nuclear in the 60s. They ignored misguided environmental campaigners and they now have a sustainable, secure, low carbon source of energy. Meanwhile, our progress on nuclear has been anemic. Just as France are planning to build multiple new power plants in the next few years, we're finally getting around to building one, the long delayed Hinkley Point C plant in Somerset. There are now just six working nuclear power stations left in Britain. Six. All are scheduled to close by 2035. And the price of energy is not the only problem this country has. Supply is under threat as well, with rumours this week that the national grid may literally suck the power out of electric car batteries overnight if the energy is required. That's your car parked on the driveway or on the street. Welcome to hell. Now, I want to clean up the planet and get our carbon down, and I'm no climate change denier. We have a duty to future generations. But the zeal for net zero, with no questions asked, cannot be justified if it decimates our economy and severely impacts people's livelihoods and quality of life, all whilst China, India, Brazil and the US continue to pollute for fun. The long-term opportunities for green energy are massive for this country. It's a huge potential employer and a potential source of national income as well. Go green and the world will be green with envy. So yes, let's be number one in this green revolution where our technology and expertise is already world class. But energy policy is always about the right mix. Why are we bowing to the green lobby when it will damage our country or economy and our society in the years ahead? The green lobby were wrong about nuclear power and they overestimated wind and solar. Now I've got huge optimism about the future of Britain. We're set to have the fastest growth in the G7 and England is set to be the freest country in Europe as a result of the early lifting of COVID restrictions. Well done, Boris. If you're going to prove me wrong, Boris, you're going the right way about it. But if we're going to bounce back, our economic long-term recovery will be fueled by fuel itself. We need a sensible, cost-effective solution to the country's energy needs without making Vladimir Putin any more billions. If you don't have control of your energy resources, you are hostage to international fortune and potentially limitless price hikes. Our dependence on other people's energy is something that will be leveraged by those that wish us ill. Critics of shale gas are worried about earthquakes. Well, the international tectonic plates are shifting on the border of Ukraine as we speak, which is a far greater threat. The idea of achieving energy independence via shale gas in the short to medium term makes the earth move for me. The lesson from green extremists is clear. Go woke, no smoke. And it all begs the question, why the frack aren't we fracking? We haven't had the right energy policies for decades. All it's been from politicians for years is hot air.